everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Or from wherever you join us online. Welcome to our debate on defending human rights for lawyers in authoritarian times. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this side event for the 47th session of the UN Human Rights Council here at Villa Monnier and online. I would first of all at the outset, outset um, thank, uh, like to thank Martin Hamill's Award Foundation, the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute, and the Geneva Bar Association for their collaboration. And thank you all for joining here in the room and most of you online. Just uh, one word of housekeeping just for the announcement of the Zoom room. So this is a public meeting and it will be recorded and made available online afterwards for those who are not able to join us now live. So please be aware of this. Uh, for those online, please do mute your microphones until you take the floor later on in the discussion, but you may wish to turn on your camera um, so we see you also here in the room on our big screen. To ask questions later on, um, you can please write in the chat. There are colleagues monitoring the chat, and you can also raise your electronic hand if you want to be put on the list uh, for um, comments and questions later on in the discussion section. So much for housekeeping. Now, um, you all know probably the Geneva Human Rights Platform as a place for discussion on the functioning of the United Nations human rights mechanisms. But actually, this functioning largely depends on how victims or claimants can address and interact with the system, and more generally, how Geneva can play a role to protect lawyers or other activists from intimidation in their own countries when they cooperate with the United Nations. Thus, it is important to discuss the role of lawyers defending human rights and defending human rights defenders in autocratic contexts. I'm looking forward to hearing from activists and lawyers on concrete cases today and from our experts on the global trends and the opportunities how we can address the issue. They will be introduced by the moderator shortly, but I would like to already thank them very much for their presence. Yet when discussing uh, the use of the rule of law and the law and order system by and within autocratic states, we should also, I think, not forget the role of more open and democratic societies and the messages that they can send while laws they establish themselves. Two recent examples which have given rise to domestic public debate, but were finally introduced, uh, come from Switzerland and France, for example, but there are unfortunately many more asked mostly in the context of anti-terrorism. There is a French police law, which in its initial version would have criminalized the filming of police officers. And in the context of police violence, it was such videos that finally triggered action. In the case of George Floyd, in absence of video evidence, probably no action would have been taken. In Switzerland, the recent law on police measures to counter uh, terrorism, this law could be an excellent inspiration, also a very welcome excuse to many autocratic leaders who are criticized by human rights activists. If Switzerland passes a law that could lead police to use intelligence that may have been obtained under torture, or to exert repression outside the scope of penal law and preventive police action, why shouldn't they? So here too, I think it is um, scope for action by local and international Geneva to criticize laws and work towards change also with the view of what does, what's the message that from Geneva or from uh, democratic countries is going um, to more autocratic countries. With those thoughts in mind, let me hand over to the moderator of today's event, to Sandrine Giroux, who is uh, sitting next to me. She is chair of the Human Rights Committee at the DAS, the Geneva Bar Association and a partner at the LIV, uh, where she specializes in domestic and international litigation with a focus on commercial disputes, fraud, asset recovery, white collar crime, mutual, mutual legal assistance in civil and criminal matters, uh, trust in the state media laws, so that's quite a long list, but also in, uh, very pertinently for today, public international law and human rights. So with this, over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Felix, and welcome to all of you uh, here at the Villa and also on screen. It's re really my honor but, uh, to, to welcome you and to moderate this panel, and I'm very humbled to be uh, here to do that because we are accompanied by very courageous colleagues all over the world who put their life at stake to defend the very value that we all share, which are human rights, which we bound us as human, uh, and which transcend any form of, of political regimes. And I think that this is very important to stress 
uh, irrespective of politics, what is really the fundamental, fundamental fabric of society is the law. Uh, and most fundamental aspects are human rights. And we need people to uphold these values. And those are often human rights defenders and more particularly lawyers. Uh, and you will be hearing from very courageous people today who've taken action to try to defend those values. Um, we, as the Geneva Bar Association, we try to do also our share, um, sitting in a very comfortable place, Geneva, which is a beautiful place, and uh, we don't have so much um, issues to deal with as other countries will be discussing, but as Felix mentioned, uh, we had we have also our fights. Um, we had one which we lost. The Geneva Bar took a very uh, strong stance against the recent law, which was uh, passed, well, voted by the Swiss people on the pol uh, police measures to fight against terrorism, uh, these poses really serious concern regarding the rule of law. And unfortunately, lawyers were not heard. Uh, people hear other messages, which are more populistic, but when you try to have a reasonable debate about fundamental values, it is very difficult. So it just shows how, uh, how, how complicated the fight is and how much courage and perseverance you need to uh, continue those fights. Um, and we're here today about in very, um, very important uh, works done by the people who will speak. And I'm happy to introduce them to you um, now. We will be hearing uh, from Zhu Yang, who is the wife of Yu Wengsheng, who is a, a Chinese lawyer. He used to be a commercial lawyer. He turned a human rights uh, lawyer, defending human rights causes and cases, including several of the defendants, uh, the lawyers who were arrested in jail after the 709 crackdown in China in 2015. And three years ago, he was arrested. Uh, jail and try for the sedition in absentia. And since then, his situation is very worrisome. This year, Yu Wenchen was awarded uh, the Marty, Martin Ennals Awards uh, Prize. Uh, and we'll be hearing about his story and his fight uh, from his uh, wife, Xu Yang, who has taken up the cause of freeing her husband. Uh, she's also en route to become a lawyer having fought along her, her husband, she decided to train as a lawyer to take up the fight. Um, so I very much look forward to hearing from her and very courageous fight. We'll be also hearing from Turkey with Eşe Ashingli, who is a human rights lawyer working for the Lawyers Association for Freedom, an organization that provides legal aid, actively advocates for democratic laws, uh, in Turkey, and which has exposed numerous human rights breaches and violations in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, Aise, along with some colleagues, were arrested and have been trialed for simply doing their job as lawyers. Uh, I'm, just to give you two examples, uh, being able to discuss the follow-up of a case with their clients uh, who were accused of terrorism by, by extension, as a lawyer, she was accused also of supporting terrorism. And another example is her sitting in the same car as a client and being accused for that of, of supporting terrorism. And these are very, uh, very serious attack on the independence of lawyers and a complete identification between lawyers and their clients. And that is uh, absolutely um, problematic to the role of lawyer, it's a serious uh, uh, attempt to their independence. And despite all of this, she continues the fight along with her colleagues. As you know, uh, one of her, her colleagues died last year, uh, Evo Timtik, uh, after uh, a hunger strike because she was, she was denouncing uh, the conditions of detention and trying to have a fair trial. So um, this is really, for some people, a life and death matter. And I really look forward to uh, hearing Aisei as well on this. Uh, we will also be hearing from Tatiana Komit. Uh, Tatiana is a human rights defender and the sister of Belarusian political prisoner, uh, Maria Kalesnikova, who's also tried to stand up for human rights and uh, has been arrested and he's, he's currently in prison. So Tatiana will be explaining to us the situation in Belarus and how the fight can continue. Um, 
We are also very honored to have the presence of Baroness Elena Kennedy, who is one of Britain's most distinguished lawyers. Uh, and I have to say personally, I think a role model for many of us uh, in the fight uh, for human rights. She has spent her professional life giving voice to those who have least powers within the system, championing civil liberties and promoting human rights. Um, I could spend hours talking about all achievements in her fights. Um, so what I can say is that she's really critical to all human rights actions led by many organizations, a very supporting uh, and courageous lawyer. Um, she is currently the director of the IBA, the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute, and she has been promoting and taking actions on many, many topics. And today she'll be discussing that, but also her personal um, situation because she's been recently targeted because of the support she has provided to uh, in relation to um, lawyers and, and people in Xinjiang in China. Um, we'll be also hearing from Diego Garza Sayan. Uh, many of you uh, certainly know uh, Diego Garza Sayan. He's the UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, who is really the guardian angel of lawyers and, and judges. Um, he was previously a judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, where he was elected vice president and president of the court for two consecutive terms. But he also someone who worked really hard on peace in his country. Uh, he has served as Peru Minister of Justice, helping normalizing Peru's relationship with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, leading Peru's ratification of the Rome Statute, which you all know is a very fundamental instrument in the fight against impunity of international crime. Um, he has wor also worked with the United Nations, including as a chairperson of its working group on enforced and involuntary disappearances. Um, so his take on the situation will be absolutely uh, important. Um, and last but not least, we'll be hearing from Phil Lynch, who is the Director of International Service for Human Rights and has overall responsibility for the organization, strategy, policy, programs and operation. As many of you must know, this organization is really critical to provide support to human rights defenders and has done a great deal uh, in establishing standards to try to help them. So we'll be hearing from that. But uh, it is really thanks to Phil's stewardship that uh, these significant de developments could take place. Uh, before joining uh, International Service for Human Rights, Phil was also very active in Australia, uh, having founded and led the award-winning Human Rights Law Centre and Homeless Law in Australia. Uh, and he's a former member of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency Advisory Board and former member of the Australian Government Human Rights Grand Scheme Expert Panel. So as you'll see, we have really a fantastic panel to give you a, a, a take on the situation now in China, in Belarus, in, uh, in Turkey, and in many other places in the world, and to discuss what we can do or what organization can do to support human rights defenders, lawyers, but also to hold, uphold these very fundamental value, which all bind us. So without some further ado, I uh, pass on the, uh, well, not the microphone, but the words to Diego to give us uh, his take on the situation now in 2021 and how is the situation in relation to human rights defenders and uh, lawyers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandrine. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Felix. I'm uh, really honored uh, by the invitation of these uh, very prestigious organizations. Very honored to have the opportunity uh, to share uh, my personal support and my support of Rapporteur to the very courageous uh, lawyers that uh, today uh, we, are, uh, we have with us or represented by very relevant uh, people. Uh, lawyers play a vital role in the protection of rule of law and human rights. It is the responsibility of lawyers to protect and establish the rights of citizens from whatever culture they may be threatened. And as we all know, it is indispensable for ensuring effective access to justice for all. But so do the opponents of the rule of law, the promoters of authoritarianism, of justice at the service of particular interests, and of impunity of corruption of human rights violations. 
around the world, lawyers are being harassed, threatened, attacked, or worse, for simply doing their job. In this regard, the basic principles and the role of lawyers adopted in the, by the UN in 1980 are a fundamental international human rights tool that we will we do to remember and reaffirm always. The new context of the pandemic has brought tragedy not only to millions of families who already mourn the deaths of almost 4 million people worldwide. The measures that different states have had to take in the face of the health crisis have had an impact not only on the economy, but also on the functioning of institutions, including justice and the role of lawyers. Since the World Health Organization declared on 11 March 2020 that COVID-19 had reached the level of a global pandemic, as a special reporter, I have been closely monitoring how the pandemic affected judicial systems, access to justice, and especially the role of the legal profession. My next annual report that I will present next Monday, 28th, at the Human Rights Council deals precisely with this crucial issue of tremendous impact on humankind, including rule of law. The report is already available in the, uh, in, in the, in the web. The pandemic has severely affected the functioning of judicial systems increasing the risk of a lack of functioning, accessible and independent justice. Under authoritarian regimes, restrictions on judicial independence and attacks on the free exercise of the legal profession have tended to be accentuated. This impact has been uneven and differentiated in each country, but has also tended to affect vulnerable groups disproportionately. While some of the impacts of the pandemic and access, on access to justice, the functioning of justice, and judicial independence are temporary, others will bring about definitive changes. How these challenges may affect the human rights, judicial independence, and the role of lawyers is a matter of particular concern that needs to be closely monitored. In some countries, the role of lawyers in the courts has not, was not defined as an essential service, blocking the provision of legal services. In many other contexts, the role of lawyers has been and is under systematic attack. Some countries that I will mention briefly. In Egypt, lawyers were detained without warrants for long periods before being brought before the courts, despite the enormous risk of COVID-19 infection in, Egypt's, in Egyptian detention centers. In Turkey, international lawyers associations have denounced how harassment of the legal profession has become government policy. Together with other thematic mandates from the, at the, of the Human Rights Council, the Special Rapporteur transmitted a communication to the government of, of Turkey expressing concern about the arrest in September 2020 in Ankara, the city with the highest number of COVID-19 infections in the country of 48 lawyers, seven legal practitioners, four dismissed judges, and one law graduate. In the Philippines, the government has been repeatedly denounced for this policy of human rights violation. Defamation, harassment of lawyers, and impunity for dozens of murder lawyers have increased during the pandemic. These attacks were allegedly perpetrated mainly by members of the president's counterinsurgency tax force, as well as by the national security agencies and state security forces. In Zimbabwe, civil society organizations documented assaults, torture, and other inhuman and degrading treatment and or punishment, illegal arrests, and detention of opposition activists without access to lawyers. Several Zimbabwean lawyers were arrested or harassed for their professional and human rights activities in the context of the pandemic. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, human rights defender and lawyer Nasrin Sotudeh has sent, was sent back to prison by the authorities despite testing positive for COVID-19 and against medical advice. As a special reporter, I severely condemned in December 2020 the government action and will continue to follow up her case. In Libya, November 2020 saw the, mur the murder of lawyer and women's rights activist Hanan Albaraz. She was shot dead after she spoke out against widespread corruption in the context of the pandemic. Dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, uh, the, uh, the occasion that uh, meets us today is absolutely uh, opportune and fantastic. I will uh, follow uh, very closely the discussion that, uh, uh, that begins now and express uh, my strong support to the lawyers that are uh, here present, to the lawyers that, that are being duly represented, and my deep appreciation uh, for the organization that have uh, organized this uh, meeting for in the, inviting me and the honor I have to uh, share the panel 
with Baroness Elena Kennedy, with Phil Lynch, with Ashley Ashley and uh, by, by the other colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. I will uh, follow up the discussion very close. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, unfortunately, your report is, uh, shows that the situation is only worsening, uh, which is very uh, disheartening to, to hear. Um, and, and that's the situation. I mean, the fight has to continue and they, they never stops. But we'll be hearing now from people we on the ground um, who's, who are working in different countries. Uh, I believe we'll start with, uh, with you on. I think we have a recording. Uh, and it will come in a second. Hello,大家好,我叫许燕,是余文生律师的妻子。余文生律师现在还被关押在中国的南京监狱。非常感谢国际上和各界人士对余文生律师案件的关注和帮助。余文生律师案件被秘密开庭秘密判决差五天就三年整的时候才第一次让妻子许燕与余文生会见余文生现在不仅是右手颤抖残疾的不可以写字以外首先他提出修改宪法的建议是直接被抓捕的很主要的原因中国警察多次传唤和约谈短时间传唤到派出所要求他停止为七零九律师去工作但是余文生律师一直在继续为七零九律师去看征法律权利为人权法制去努力这个也是他被抓捕很重要的原因同时他多年来为信仰类案件维权类案件去代理为反酷刑方面和黄保方面起诉政府治理物埋不利这些都是让中国政府很记恨的原因余文生律师获得有所改善在此非常感谢尊敬的马丁恩纳尔斯人权奖的支持和帮助余文生律师在二省江苏省高级人民法院裁定之后实际上还是没有改进当时徐州市看守所依然不让家属会见而且把余文生投到南京监狱也没有告知家属家属在非常多的努力下在二月份才查询出余文生律师被调到南京监狱的所以余文生处境的改善还是从二月十一号获得马丁恩纳尔斯人权奖以后有所改进的
，但是呃。仍然还有一些法律权利没有得到保障，例如这个放风权非常的少，嗯，约一个星期左右才放风一次，呃，没有笔写字，嗯，呃，我想请求世界各地和日内瓦，呃，帮助的事项是，嗯、呃，请求要求中国政府，呃，持续的。呃，给余文生治疗右手颤抖残疾的问题、安装新牙的问题和其他身体，诶治疗的问题，呃，要求中国政府能够，嗯，呃，释放余文生律师回家治疗，嗯，要求中国政府停止对余文生家人的恐吓，嗯、呃，跟踪、限制出门等情形，呃，保障。妻子和孩子正常的生活和学习的法律权利，嗯，呃，最后，嗯，我也请求，呃，大家能够对余文生律师案件、对其他的人权律师案件和人权捍卫者案件以及他们的家人的处境给予持续的关注和帮助，谢谢大家。Well, you had uh, Zuyan explain the situation of her husband, uh, Yu Wangshen, which is really an example of what human rights defenders and lawyers who take up uh, human rights causes in certain countries can suffer. Um, you also heard her about the impact of certain prizes and uh, show of solidarity can have on the lawyer sometimes. It can help really their situation improve and sometimes keep them alive. And that's something that also, as a bar association, we wonder often uh, how we can support them um, and by sending letters. But here we see that the prima finals, for instance, can have really uh, an important impact in their life. And I think that's a point to keep in mind that we'll be discussing later. Uh, but this is a very courageous. Uh, story and I would say double courageous story because it's a, it's a story of a couple, a husband and a wife taking up the fight. Uh, we'll be discussing China a little bit more uh, now also with Baroness Kennedy, uh, who has recently experienced some very uh, hostile uh, actions on the part of China in relation to a uh, certain uh, position that she took in action that he took to defend uh, the rule of law and human rights. So Baroness Kennedy, uh, the word is yours and uh, I'd be happy for you to share your story uh, on this. It's, it's an enormous privilege to join all of you today. Um, as you can see, I'm sitting here in a part of the House of Lords um, where I am a member of, uh, of this upper part of our legislature. And uh, I, I'm going to have to leave before the very end of this meeting, which I regret. But it wasn't it wonderful to listen to uh, the wife of a, of a truly courageous lawyer. And I cannot, cannot claim uh, to be a courageous lawyer. Um, I'm doing what I would urge all lawyers around the world to do, which is to speak out when we see terrible wrongs taking place and to speak out as lawyers in the protection of the rule of law. Because without it, uh, there cannot be uh, any uh, claim for rights. Um, and without lawyers and judges, independent lawyers and independent judges, the system can't work. And people who have their rights abused cannot ever secure justice because they need legal assistance from independent lawyers um, without fear and without uh, any uh, uh, coercion, who will go into court and argue their cases and demand rights, the rights of their clients. And, uh, and that should be whatever their clients' thoughts are or whatever their belief systems are. Um, I've represented many people who were seen by the state as terrorists and were accused of terrorist offenses. And many of them were in fact innocent. Um, I have represented people on national security issues. And, and again, uh, uh, they haven't been uh, guilty of some of the things for which they've been charged. They need to be represented by independent 
rigorous lawyers applying the law on their behalf. And they need to have, we need to have judges who are independent sitting in the courts. Now, what we know is that authoritarian regimes uh, don't believe in the rule of law. And, uh, and they certainly don't believe in independent uh, uh, judges and lawyers. They want the decision to go their way. And uh, the, the account of, of uh, this wonderful uh, wife who is still fighting for her lawyer husband um, is, is humbling. And I think all of us should feel that. Now, what happened for me was that um, I, because I have, I'm both a lawyer and someone who sits in our, our sort of higher chamber, um, I um, put together my lawyering skills um, and with some others, and we put an amendment into the trade bill that was going through Parliament um, to say that uh, we should not be trading with a country that is in the process of committing a genocide, as I believe is happening to the Uyghur in China. And, uh, and our duty under international law and, uh, and uh, the Genocide Convention isn't to wait until a genocide is over and the, there are mass graves. We're supposed to prevent genocide. And when we see serious indications that a genocide um, is taking place, our duty as, as uh, other nations is to act and as lawyers in other nations to alert people to the ways in which law is being tra transgressed. And so I uh, uh, um, with, got together with other lawyers and we drafted an amendment and we made a suggestion that if, you, if China is blocking access to the International Court of Justice um, because of uh, its veto powers under the current ways of, in which the uh, UN is put together, um, if, if, if China also did not sign up to the International Criminal Court, then, there, then our government is saying, well, you know, what can we do? Well, what we can do is we can actually decide, does the evidence reach the bar for genocide, certainly for crimes against humanity? And should we, as Western nations, for example, be trading with China? And shouldn't we be having some tough conversations? I, I, I love the Chinese people. Um, I've had I've gone to China on many different occasions, and uh, and I I really feel that we have to speak, but firmly, but with in friendship for the Chinese people about what is being done by their government in their name, and we have to say we're not going to trade until you start respecting the rule of law, and also respecting the human rights of the people who are trying to get the rule of law to work. Here was a, a lawyer trying to get justice for 700 and uh, over 700 uh, other lawyers who were taking cases um, uh, which were about people's rights. Um, and he himself was acting uh, for people, you know, people on religious freedom. He was acting for people um, in, in their health because of the ways in which government had failed to provide clean air. He was taking up the sort of cases that we as lawyers should be taking up. And it doesn't matter whether people are commercial lawyers or corporate lawyers or employment lawyers. All of us as lawyers have a duty to make the case for the rule of law and to protect the rule of law and to protect what it means, which is fairness, due process. That You don't throw people in prison and leave them there um, for many years before they get to see lawyers. You don't uh, uh, punish people by not letting them have proper access to their family. You don't punish their families on the outside by creating limitations on their lives. And you certainly don't torture people. And yet we've heard about this man, uh, this, this wonderful lawyer who now has a tremor in his hand, um, who now has lost teeth, uh, who, who clearly has been, uh, um, uh, has suffered um, to have those uh, disabilities now. And, uh, and we owe it to speak out. And so I would, I'm going to make some strong urges on, the, on the, the United Nations and on the community of lawyers around the world uh, to come together um, to create the right kind of uh, protections that there can be for lawyers who are uh, facing this kind of uh, abuse within the uh, uh, systems in their, own, in their own nations. So I, I can only tell you that I wakened up one morning to find that I had been put on a targeted sanctions list by China, um, that I'm not uh, allowed to travel there or to Hong Kong or Taiwan, um, nor can any of the members of my family. And I have some 
grown up children and grandchildren. Um, not, my husband is a surgeon and has great connections with uh, doctors in China. And uh, I uh, and any any assets that I might have or any business connections I might have um, uh, must be frozen too. Um, now that's a, a, a minimal infliction on me. Um, but uh, the, it, and it's about freedom of expression, of course, that I, as a lawyer, speaking about the law, speaking about the way in which law is being abused and the rights of people being abused, I am to be silenced um, by the Chinese government. Well, it tells you a little bit about the Chinese government. And so all I can say is that um, uh, we all of us have to stand together um, in the protection of lawyers who are really suffering. And I can't count myself amongst them. Thank you, Baroness Kennedy. Uh, I beg to differ on the last point, but thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I think it just shows that uh, certain countries, or I would say certain regime, because again, we're not talking about countries, we're talking about regimes, because the people in their country may have different views, uh, as, you, as you may know. So certain regime will stop at nothing. And I think your testimony is very important because along with some of your colleagues in England, you were directly targeted, and some of the colleagues you, uh, also in England were targeted by simply issuing a legal opinion based on information they have, which came to the conclusion that in their opinion, uh, based on the information they had, what was happening in Xinjiang was tantamount to genocide and crimes against humanity. So lawyers sitting in London taking that position was, were targeted by China. And it tells you that beyond the boundaries of one country, even taking up uh, the stance of upholding the rule of law, can, you, you can be targeted. And, and that really echoes what you just said, Baroness Kennedy. It's about trying to silence uh, lawyers and those who uphold the rule of law. And I think that is very important because today we're just saying we're not going to be silent and we will keep on shouting until the rule of law is applied. Um, so thank you very much, Baroness Kennedy, and I'll come back to you a little bit uh, later on before you have to, to leave us to discuss also what you do at the IBA. Um, and now I'd like to pass on the word to Aisha Ashingli, who will, as uh, I mentioned, explain to us the situation in Turkey. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aisha Genitli, and uh, Sandrine uh, introdu introduced me before. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to such a uh, great uh, event. Uh, today, I will try to mention the situation of human rights defenders of and uh, human rights uh, lawyers in Turkey, and also uh, something about our organization's activities. Uh, for other countries, people can discuss the attitude of the government, state, ministry, or uh, etc. Something like that. But in Turkey, uh, there is no need such uh, discussions because there is always and just one man uh, decide everything. It's actually unbelievable, but it's true. The country situation, everyone knows such a mess, uh, but uh, you know who is proud of uh, deciding everything by himself uh, to have such a power. Uh, the system that we are currently governing is not democracy, really. Uh, the civil society even can't say what they want. There is some way of, uh, to uh, tell what they want. One is sharing something on so social media. But this is a reason to be judged, to be charged uh, from making propaganda of um, any terrorist organization or being a member of uh, any terrorist or, or organization, insulting the president or incite the people to hatred and enmity. Making an action in streets is also very dangerous. The police is attacking very hard. Uh, and uh, taking people under custody. Uh, in the period of 21 years with IKP, changed a lot of things. They created uh, their civil society. There are a lot of organizations which defend one man's idea and will always so support what he says, no matter what. Uh, so when they sometimes they need to seem uh, like taking suggestions from the civil society, 
uh, when they need it, they call only their civil society organization and listen them and nothing is changed, nothing is uh, uh, told about. Uh, but actually for the real human rights defenders, life is really hard. Custody, prison, cases, lynch, losing their job, kidnapping, even being killed. In the situation of human rights defenders, lawyers, uh, the same things happen to them actually, uh, but uh, they can also ban us to take some cases uh, if we are judged or uh, investigated uh, from being a member of a uh, terrorist organization or making a propaganda of terrorist organization. Uh, so if you are a political lawyer, you are not uh, an exec lawyer. Besides banning cases and investigation, also you can be a mediator or facilitator. Uh, as I said in the beginning, um, I am from the Association of Lawyers for Freedom. When they called state of emergency to uh, 2016, they cl closed a lot of organization which work in the human rights field. And our organization was one of them. Uh, we work on as a platform till uh, 219. Then we opened our organization with, uh, but we had to make a little change uh, about the name because they uh, didn't accept the same name. Uh, our center is in Diyarbakir and we have uh, 13 arms all over the world. We mostly uh, work on Kurdish problem. That means we work about prisons, torture in prison, torture in custody, torture in streets, even torture in cemetery. Women rights uh, also, we all follow the cases of HDP also. Uh, we make visits, uh, we visit prisons regularly and make reports and share, share them with the press and the public. If people uh, apply for the human rights violation, we follow their judicial process. Uh, those are uh, daily works, uh, but actually uh, we fight for the change legal regulation according to human rights. We make all of this as lawyers, uh, we are making, uh, actually making our jobs, but uh, this, uh, Things, these activities we are doing uh, is being uh, to be charged uh, a member of terrorist organization. In Turkey nowadays, for a long time actually, being a terrorist uh, or uh, making any terrorist propaganda is the easiest thing really. You can uh, be a terrorist doing anything and talking um, about anything or uh, criticize anything about the one, one man. Uh, that's all for now. Uh, um, I would be glad to answer if uh, any questions, uh, if we have enough time. Thank you again. Thank you very much, AC. Well, I have a question. I mean, you, you had uh, you had a, a hearing this week, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to know how it went and uh, what the situ what your personal situation, because you also been arrested and, and also jailed. So what is your personal situation currently? Uh, I was arrested in uh, 216 and stayed in prison for five months. Uh, this uh, actually, um, the court uh, want to uh, punish us immediately. Uh, they only gave us time to do uh, October. Uh, in October, we will have the final hearing uh, and uh, they want to punish us immediately. I can tell it. Uh, the situation isn't very um, hopeful, I can tell. Uh, all of the, there is 13, yes, 13 uh, lawyers in our case, uh, and all of the uh, charges are about to uh, make uh, human rights lawyers that make our jobs. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the uh, judge, the, he, uh, the court will uh, punish us, uh, I don't know how many years. Just, I don't know how many years. Okay. 
And well, importantly, what can we do to help you now in the run-up of your trial? What, what would work uh, as, as lawyers or fellow um, human rights defenders? Actually, uh, I uh, want to thank you and uh, another uh, lawyers association from bars uh, from all over the all over the Europe because um, our lawyer friends are uh, always uh, coming and. Uh, they are uh, following our cases. That's uh, really uh, helping for us. A at least we feel uh, that we aren't alone and uh, people are uh, supporting us. But uh, anything else, I don't know. Uh, may maybe we can discuss together. But coming here and following the situation is really very important. And uh, thank you for doing that. Well, thanks to you, to Ria, for your fight and your courage, your true inspiration. Um, and uh, as a lawyer, it's, it's really amazing to see people like you. So thank you very much. Uh, now we'll be hearing about uh, Tatiana Komich. As I say, she's the sister um, of a Belarus uh, political prisoner who is defending her sister and who is taking action as a, as a human rights defender. She's not a lawyer, but her cause is very important as well. She's using other tools, many different tools to try to uphold the rule of law and human rights. So, uh, Tiana, the word is yours. As of June 20, there are 501 political prisoners in Belarus and their number grows every day since the summer of 2020. According to the General Prosecutor's Office, more than 3,000 criminal cases have been initiated for violating the procedure for holding mass events and protests since August 2020. More than 35,000 people were subjected to administrative arrest or fines. Lawyers who criticize the actions of the authorities or who represent politicians and activists are also persecuted. Government's tactics against lawyers is expressed in several ways. Criminal prosecutions, disbarment due to administrative arrest, disciplinary actions, or recertification, and also harass in the media. The most important issue of the stated above are criminal prosecution, and the most important case here related to the lawyer is the case of Maxim Znak. Maxim Znak is under arrest since 9th of September 2020. He joined the election campaign of the presidential candidate Viktor Babarika. Maxim Znak represented interests of Viktor Babarika in state bodies during the election campaign, provided legal assistance to the headquarters, publicly explained election legislation on media to the voters, and develop legal documents. After that, he represented Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's interests on the base of the power of authority. For example, after the elections, he appealed the election results as Svetlana Tikhanovskaya lawyers to the Supreme Court. Maxim became a member of the board of the Coordination Council in August 2020, which was created to overcome political crisis in Belarus. Due to stated above activities, Maxim Znak is accused of three cases of criminal court. They are calls for actions aimed at causing harm to the national security of Belarus, committed using the media and the internet, conspiracy to seize state power by unconstitutional means, and creation of an extremist group and its leadership. Maxim Znak's lawyers used all procedural and jurisdictional remedies and none of the appeals was satisfied. The investigation is carried out by the Central Office of Investigative Committee and the General Prosecutor's Office is a supervisor. What issues did the lawyers face during the case? General Prosecutor's Office does not consider appeals and redirects it for the consideration to the Investigation Committee. There is no high institution above Prosecutor General's Office who to appeal to. It means there is no way to challenge the decision of the investigation. Lawyers are also limited by a non-disclosure agreement on the details of the preliminary investigation 
and there is no opportunity to review results of expertise made by state investigation by independent experts. The second tactics used as prosecution is expressed in disbarment. In Belarus, bar licenses are issued by Qualification Commission of Minister of Justice, where there are representatives of state bodies. Lawyers are in the minority there. Alexander Prychenko was a lawyer for presidential candidate Viktor Babarika and politician Maria Kolesnikova. In August 2020, Alexander Prychenko explained which authorities have responsibility to end torture and violence in the media. This was considered as an act as disqualifying the lawyer. The Qualification Commission decided that Alexander Prychenko should be disbarred. The second case is related to Lyudmila Kazak. In 2020, Lyudmila Kazak was Maria Kolesnikova's lawyer. On 24th of September, Mrs. Kazak was abducted by a man without insignia and forced into a car and later appeared to be detained. No one was informed about the fact. The charge for violation of mass events rules laying grounds for the detention had never got to the court. However, she was still charged with a fine for disobedience to a lawful order, for screaming while men without insignia forced her into a car. In February 2021, a commission at the Ministry of Justice found Mrs. Kazak not fit to be an attorney and recalled her license on the grounds of the above-mentioned charge. The tactics of disbarment changed after that. The latest disbarments happened due to not passing the recertification of the Qualification Commission. At any time, any action of a lawyer can be a reason to call a lawyer and check qualification. Proficiency certification turns into an exam in the field of law with an unlimited range of questions in all regulatory legal acts of the Republic of Belarus. There are the following cases when lawyers were called to recertification allegedly participation in violation of the established procedure of conducting mass events, which leads to an administrative offense. The second one is demonstration of solidarity and support for lawyers who already faced with prosecution or was disbarred. The third one, comments on media related to Minister of Internal Affairs actions. The fourth one, refused to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which, which leads to disciplinary proceedings and subsequent disbarment. Lawyers recently became the targets of state propaganda. There are public threats from government officials addressed to the lawyers and harassment in the media. Currently, there are about 20 cases of disbarment triggered by presidential elections in August 2020. Political prisoners were shocked by the news about attorneys and we are very concerned if there will be more attorneys willing to risk everything to undertake their defense. Such person's constitutional right for professional defense is jeopardized. Other attorneys involved in political cases are constantly disadvantaged by law enforcement. They are not allowed to meet their clients, not allowed to make digital copies of many volume materials of the investigation. Public not allowed freely to court hearings, and many, many others. The National Bar Association has done nothing to protect its members, and to the contrary, insists that attorneys must be loyal to the official and should handle possible violations low-key. Most recently, the Ministry of Justice initiated amendments to the law on attorney's activities to strengthen its grip over the institution. The amendments of the law on attorney's activities was ratified on May 27th. The information about the law appeared on independent telegram channels in March. The law was prepared in secret from the attorney's community. The main changes to the law are only legal consultation is left among the forms of advocacy. Law firms and individual practices of advocacy are removed from the forms of advocacy. Legal consultations are guided by a head whose appointment has to be negotiated with the Minister of Justice. The second one, the Minister of Justice gets a huge influence on forming the Bar Council, the main executive body. 
the candidates of the attorneys who will run for the council have to be negotiated with the Minister of Justice. This also has the right to nominate its candidates. Even if the attorney's community doesn't approve of these candidates, they will still be considered elected after two rounds of negotiations. The third one is that the Minister of Justice gets the right to negotiate with the attorney's interns. For example, current students who are protesting are not going to be approved and won't have a chance to become attorneys. There is a simplified procedure for ex-law enforcement and judicial personnel to become attorneys. This is a forced change. However, only for those who will be recommended by the authorities. So, if, for example, a judge they won't have a right to a simplified procedure. Many attorneys will leave their job because it's very complicated to work under such pressure. The attorneys will lose their license with so much additional authority over them. Thank you, Tatiana. This was a recorded message, but Tatiana is also with us today. Uh, as you saw, she discussed how lawyers are attacked in Belarus, are uh, uh, the subject of criminal prosecution, but also more importantly, disbarment procedure, because what else can you do if you don't want lawyers is just to make them disappear, not only physically, but just take away their license to practice as a lawyer. Um, and and uh, some of the people who help her sister, Maria Kalasnikova, were targeting as such as being their lawyer, uh, her, their lawyers, uh, they have been directly targeted. So uh, what I found also striking is really the lack of support, but more or even more the, the pressure put by bar associations to uh, go along the path of the government and not to stand up by their uh, members. So uh, thank you very much to Tana and we'll come back to you uh, with some question at the end. I'm, I'm conscious of time and just also for those who are seeing you on the screen, don't, uh, don't take it personally if you don't necessarily look you in the eyes, but it's just that the setup makes the, uh, that the screen is on this side and so we don't necessarily look you directly um, into, into the camera. Um, so uh, now with time passing, I'll uh, give the floor to our three experts. Uh, Felinch, Baroness Elena Kennedy, and Diego, Diego Garcia San to explain to us what NGOs and organizations or professional associations such as the IBA can do to help human rights defenders and lawyers. And I'd be um, happy if they could uh, be grateful to them if they could uh, keep it rather brief so that we can take uh, about 15 minutes for question at the end. Uh, so I'll start with, with Phil. Uh, Phil, can you, it's a pleasure to have you here and I'd be really happy to hear more about what you do and your organisation. Um, well, thank you very much, Sandrine, and uh, thank you to, to all my fellow panellists. Uh, I'd like to start by really expressing uh, my solidarity and support and that of the International Service for Human Rights uh, for all detained human rights lawyers and their families and their associates. Um, thank you for your courage and thank you for your commitment to freedom uh, dignity, equality, and justice for all. The right to defend human rights uh, is a human right in and of itself, and it's also integral to the promotion, protection, and realisation of all other human rights. That's why the work of human rights lawyers is so important. It contributes to the promotion, protection, and realisation of all human rights and accountability for violations, particularly for people and communities who are disadvantaged or who experience discrimination or marginalization. Authoritarians and autocrats know this, and that's precisely why they target human rights lawyers. To do so reinforces and sends a message of unrestrained power and absolute impunity. That's also why we should be so deeply concerned about attacks and restrictions against human rights lawyers. Such attacks and restrictions including widespread arbitrary detention in places like Belarus, China, Egypt, and Russia, amount not only to violations against the detained lawyers and their families, but also to violations for the rights for which they advocated and an attack against the fundamental rule of law. So moving on to what can be done about this at the international level, particularly here in Geneva. In May of this year, ISHR launched a new study 
which examined the impact of UN actions in 709 cases of reprisals over the period 2010 to 2020. And we examined that impact from the perspective of the victims themselves. The most significant finding of the study is that public advocacy and public diplomacy work. We found that there's a positive association between UN actors speaking out and other high level actors speaking out in UN spaces and positive outcomes for victims, whether that was release from detention, an amelioration of conditions of detention, or even a sense of solidarity and support, which contributed to the resilience and well-being of the defenders. What's more, we found that this positive association got stronger as more actors spoke out over a sustained period. To put this another way, authoritarians and autocrats don't like scrutiny. They don't like accountability. They seek to manage their reputations. And the more actors that speak out publicly against repression of human rights lawyers, the more politically costly such repression becomes, particularly if the pressure is sustained. As an aside, despite being the preferred approach of many UN officials, not least the Secretary General and the UN High Commissioner in the case of China, I'm not aware of any study demonstra demonstrating a similar positive outcome from quiet or private diplomacy. In short, my message is simple. Speak out, encourage others to speak out, and continue to speak out until human rights lawyers are able to do their vital work free from harassment and restraint. Thanks very much, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Phil. I mean, that is absolutely critical studies that you've done here because often when you're trying to take action as a, as a lawyer or as a human rights defender or someone supporting uh, lawyers who are in danger or human rights defenders who are in danger, you're not really sure if what you're doing matters and how to do it. So having studies like this, research to show what works, help you really uh, try to put the efforts at the right place. But I think it's incredibly valuable to know that it is useful to be vocal. It is useful to continue to be vocal and to persist. Uh, so thank you, Rui, for these words of hope. Um, Baroness Kennedy, I'm, I'm conscious that you have to leave us very shortly. So uh, I'd be happy for you to tell us a bit more what you're doing with the IBA uh, and how you think a professional organization like the IBA can help and matters. I know that the IBA has taken very courageous stances on different issues. Uh, in different countries. So um, thank you very much uh, already for your work as a director and for the effort to all, all the institutes. Uh, but please share with us your experiences and, and tips on what to do. Uh, Sandrine, thank you so much. And I want to express appreciation to Sandrine and to the uh, Geneva Bar Association because it was so heartening to receive a message from you um, of support and solidarity uh, when uh, in that sort of moment after a uh, period after uh, being put on a sanctions list and knowing that my own cyber security might not be very uh, uh, secure um, to hear solidarity from other lawyers. And I, I couldn't agree more than what has just been said um, about uh, the importance of our speaking out um, and encouraging others to speak out. And I think that um, all of us have that responsibility, but particularly we as lawyers who are in safer places um, where we can actually um, be voices for those who are really under threat. But I'm going to speak about a number of things. We've got to remember that um, the right to, to human rights as you've just heard, is a, is a human rights or human right itself. And we have to make sure that that is expressed in that way. Um, and that lawyers can represent all kinds of people. Um, and the idea that uh, simply because you're acting for somebody that that makes you punishable should not be acceptable. And, uh, and of course, as we've just heard, authoritarians go after lawyers in the same way that they go after um, uh, 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 journalists, they go after judges who are independent. That's it's always a signal of authoritarianism when you see that those the rule of law, the, the, the practitioners in law, judges and independent lawyers under attack. Um, it's a signifier. And we've just heard, I mean, think of what's happened just now, the arrest immediately of Navalny's lawyer. The Magnitsky, Magnitsky sanctions regimes came out of the arrest of a lawyer who was exposing corruption in the Russian system, and he ended up in prison 
where he ended up being ill-treated and ended up dead. Um, uh, we know that um, in uh, Duterte's five years of, uh, of leading uh, the regime in the Philippines, 61 lawyers have been murdered with impunity. Um, uh, we know about uh, the arbitrary detentions that there are, and we've heard about Belarus and Turkey, and of course it ha it's happening in other places too, just now in Nicaragua. Uh, so we, 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 we make public uh, um, interventions on these things, we were involved in setting up uh, fact-finding missions and so on. And just now, of course, we try to do things in Myanmar um, uh, with great difficulty. So all I would say is that there are two things I would recommend. First of all, targeted sanctions. They do work. Go after the people who are responsible, who have the power and who are abusers and the people who fund them because it really does have an impact if people who are really supporting and, uh, and complicit in these, uh, in these conducts if they actually suffer themselves. And some of them are living in the major cities of Europe and the United States, and so they have to be targeted and we have to be rigorous in doing that. The second thing is visas. There should be emergency visas and the UN and all of our nations should be saying, we're going to call upon our governments to make available emergency visas for lawyers, and journalists and human rights defenders to get out. Canada has just introduced over 200 visas for human rights defenders, including journalists, including those who are uh, 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 lawyers, the people who are, end up having to get out of speed and for their families. So all of our countries should be make, taking steps like that. Emergency visas, targeted sanctions, speaking out, naming and shaming. And wasn't it interesting um, that uh, our, our wonderful um, campaigning uh, wife of the lawyer, Yu Wing Shen, uh, Yu Zan said that the Martin Innes Award mattered. Oh, giving awards, putting, us, putting the, the spotlight on the, the treatment of particular lawyers. Um, it makes a difference. We're doing it for Nazreen Sutude, a lawyer in Iran just now. Put the spotlight on it, let the world uh, you know, show that they care. And it does embarrass regimes. And it provides a sort of, at least the protection um, that they're not going to be uh, murdered in the night inside a prison cell. So, so please just stick with it. Um, and that the IBA, the International Power Association, we, we give out an annual awards to, to lawyers who've done great things. Um, we did, gave it to two of the lawyers who just were prosecuted in Hong Kong, Martin Lee and Margaret Ng. And it's really important that we, that we use what powers we have um, to uh, support people who are really on the front line and doing great things. So the rule of law, we are the protectors of it, we lawyers and human rights defenders everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I take the opportunity of your presence to ask you a follow-up question because uh, you mentioned Margaret and Jane in Hong Kong who was targeted also. She's a barrister and she's been active in Hong Kong in, in the democratic uh, movement as well, but acting as a lawyer as well. Uh, and she has been uh, the subject of, of uh, proceedings in Hong Kong. Um, and the Geneva Bar Association has taken a stance to support her, like other organizations, following the steps of the IBA. Um, and I have to say, uh, Baroness Kennedy, one of the criticisms we received is that in that capacity, Margaret wasn't acting as a lawyer, she was acting as a political activist, and that's two different things. So I have my own opinion on this, and I'm not going to change. But I think for the benefit of the discussion, it would be good to hear you and also maybe later on from Diego uh, on what is the scope of lawyers and how do you, should you stop helping those lawyers when they defend certain rights that are right to demonstrate in Hong Kong or you, should you consider them as political activists? Um, when, when a lawyer is, is speaking out against uh, uh, abuses of the rule of law, um, championing human rights, speaking for democracy um, and, and, and urging the legal aspects of that as, as Margaret Ng and Martin Lee, who's a senior counsel in Hong Kong too. Um, they may be um, involved in, of course, a challenge to a repressive regime, a repressive state. Um, and so of course it starts, I mean, 
yes, it's political. Of course, it's political. Um, but the the repression is political, um, and so we should be very clear that sometimes making those distinctions is a false distinction, um, because when we're talking about the rule of law, championing human rights, we're actually talking about something that is of real substance in the decent society, in any decent society. So I, I, do, I don't think that, um, I always see that this happens with bar associations being anxious about not getting involved in the political. Um, we have a duty as lawyers. Um, we know that law matters and we know that those who are, the people who keep it going in the courtrooms um, are vital to the, to the humanity of the citizens at large. And so um, there is no, for me, that line is too, it's too complicated for us to become precious about separating it out. I'm in, I'm in Parliament too, but I, I, of course, I'm a practicing lawyer and I'm a head, the head of an Institute of Human Rights. And uh, um, I, can, I, can, I can actually be all those things in one person. And I think most of us are complicated in that way. Thank you for the very clear position, which I fully share, but I think it was very important to have this being stated. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have to leave, um, well, thank you already for your participation and again for your incredible uh, work and the uh, inspirational example that you that you give us. Um, but if you can stay with that, be happy for you to contribute again to the discussion. Uh, I'm not going to be able to. Sorry. Okay. But thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. And thank you for your support. Thank you, uh, Baroness Kennedy. So for those of you who are following us virtually, um, I'm looking at the chat to see if you have any questions and I haven't seen any so far. Um, I'll pass on the word now to Diego. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, please write them into the, the chat. Otherwise I have a couple for our, our speakers uh, today. Uh, but um, to be to now, uh, Diego, I'd like to discuss with you again uh, the, the, the notion that I've discussed now, the, the, the distinction between lawyers, human rights defenders and political activists, because I, I know from our past discussion that you have also a very clear stance on this, and I think that would be worth hearing. Thank, thank you, Sandrine, and I will follow with what Baroness Kennedy has uh, just uh, said, no? in recalling that uh, we have the basic principles on the role of lawyers adopted more than 30 years ago by the United Nations that uh, is a relevant instrument that you sh should be, be should should be used permanently in U in world standards and UN in UN bodies. Uh, one of the components of the basic principles is freedom of expression of uh, lawyers, freedom of expression and association. What does this mean in a specific context of authoritarian regimes or of the lack of uh, judicial independence when the uh, lawyers protecting human rights are permanently blocked, uh, harassed, and their cases are not uh, duly followed without freedom of expression so that people can be aware of what is going on with, with the case, what is happening with the individual, what is happening with the, with the lawyer. So uh, as it has been recalled in some examples today, uh, using the internet, using the media, participating in rallies uh, by lawyers that are defending cases in which the cases are being blocked and are being unsuccessful because of this lack of judicial independence is not only a right, I would say it's only an obligation to be uh, expeditious, to be effective in their results. So a basic human rights cannot be denied uh, to any lawyer if that uh, the exercise of those basic human rights can, uh, can help, can support his or her activity as a lawyer. And perhaps the second uh, comment I want to, 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 to raise following uh, the Phil's presentation is that this interaction between organizations of lawyers, organizations like the ones that are uh, today uh, calling us for this fantastic meeting and the UN mechanisms and the special rapporteur uh, is absolutely essential. My personal experience is that one of the major sources of relevant and daily information to know what is happening are these kind of relevant organizations. Because if we are not able to have a fluent and appropriate information on time and the possibility to act and react. And I understand what happens eventually, but lengthy, very slow 
and bureaucratic procedures that occur inside the UN, in many cases, impedes an appropriate and opportune reaction if to send a communication to a government will take uh, one or two months to draft a letter of two or three pages, which is not in position of the rapporteur because he or she is not able to act officially without using all the internal procedures. So first, if the organizations can uh, uh, reach the rapporteur with appropriate information, if they can call he or she, whoever is the rapporteur, to get in contact, to react, to, to send um, a tweet, to have a participation in a meeting like this one, that will short, be a shortcut to uh, address uh, the matter uh, substantially. Of course, uh, that will create a much more effective uh, uh, result and uh, with this kind of dialogue, which is not important, but absolutely essential. So uh, we together can do a lot of things. Uh, the rapporteur by itself is not a, a relevant authority that can take decisions in the name of the UN or binding decisions. You know perfectly well what it, how that uh, works. But of course, I, I am sure that uh, as, has been, uh, as has been mentioned uh, today, uh, for instance, in, in, in one of the examples that like Xu uh, Yang mentioned, how the situation eventually can improve uh, after international awareness is uh, drawn and it is very public and very well known. So please, uh, uh, I want to state again that I am available. It's my obligation to protect human rights and use the most efficient mechanisms in which uh, I, 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 I trust wholly, fully in what uh, organizations like yours can, can do. So the, for this, and really, if a lawyer has to act in the media, has to act in a rally to uh, support his or her case, that would be absolutely legitimate, and that has a full connection with many of the um, components of the basic principle. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much, Diego. That was a very powerful statement and very important to make. Uh, you referred to the UN basic principle on the role of lawyers, which are, uh, as you may know, really fundamental principles on what lawyers should do on ethical obligation, but also on obligation for states to protect lawyers, because without lawyers, you don't have access to justice, so justice uh, is meaningless. Uh, and I think it is important to recall that those principles were supported by all the nations, members of the United Nations. So we can't just talk about cultural relativism between what human rights may be, may be uh, understood in China or in Europe, or et cetera. These are basic principles which are accepted by all countries and what states have to respect when they deal with lawyers. Um, so I think for those of you who don't know those rules, I think it's worth looking at it uh, because that's really uh, a guiding light as to what can be done to support lawyers uh, and what can be asked as protection from states. Um, I see we have one question in the room and one on the chat, so I'll pass on the, uh, well, I'll let the person in the room ask. Okay, yeah, um, I have a question actually for Phil Lynch. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, there was a remark on the chat a few moments ago from a fellow work analyst laureate. He said that naming and shaming doesn't work anymore, and he used the term fascist regimes. So my question for Phil is, um, why does it seem sometimes that the naming and shaming or the publicity, the communication about cases doesn't have an effect? Um, and can you tell us more about those positive results in the study that was undertaken on reprisals? What can we learn? Are there some um, hacks, for example, some special tricks that, that we need to be aware of? And why does it seem at times that it just doesn't work? Um, well, thank you very much for the question, Isabel. Uh, so I think the, the, um, the mantra that naming and shaming or monitoring and accountability um, doesn't work comes primarily um, from states um, that don't like monitoring and accountability. I mean, the, 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 the states that trumpet um, dialogue and cooperation um, the most and resist monitoring and accountability the most uh, at the UN Human Rights Council, for example, are the likes of uh, China and Russia uh, and, and others who regard um, any scrutiny as an interference in their domestic affairs. Um, I think the, um, the extent to which you see countries like 
um, Russia and China uh, invest in the Human Rights Council and invest in seeking to avoid scrutiny within the Human Rights Council, um, together with the, the, the money that states like Saudi Arabia uh, invest in reputation management, um, it, it is, is very strong demonstration um, of the fact that authoritarian re regimes care. They care deeply about their reputation. Um, uh, and um, whilst this is an assertion uh, and, and, and something um, in respect of which we've had strong anecdotal evidence in the past, um, we were very pleased with the, the ISHR study because it shows um, very strong empirical evidence for the fact that monitoring and accountability works um, and it works best when more people speak out and uh, do so over a sustained period of time. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, I've seen one question in the chat on uh, sanction uh, and uh, just trying to... Um, how do you, so two questions. Why do European Court of Human Rights and the EU remain mostly silent on these issues? And how does the international community and EU see violation also in Europe? Um, these are two important questions, but I think very difficult to answer because, I mean, Felix and I can't pretend to represent the international community. And as you mean, Switzerland is not a part of the EU, so I will not even try to address the EU situation. But um, I've been mean, maybe in that context, it may be interesting to hear ASEC. Uh, if she had a take on what uh, the EU has as a position in relation to Turkey uh, and uh, her take on sanctions, because uh, Baroness Kennedy mentioned sanctions, uh, and we know that Turkey being really a neighbor of the EU, um, they, their relations are complex. So I don't know, Asa, if you're still with us, if you have a, a few words on, on that situation. Uh, can you summarize it for me? <laughs> because there's two wide questions, really, and I don't know how to answer. Uh, well, I would say let's try to make it more simple. Uh, do, you, do you feel that you support it as a, as a Turkish lawyer in danger? Do you feel that you support it by the EU and the international community, or do you feel alone? Um, okay, I can answer that. I think, uh, yes, there's a support from Europe, but uh, it's not uh, about the government uh, line. It's uh, from the organization, it's from the bar associations, it's from the lawyers, but not uh, from the countries, not from the government, or not uh, from the uh, human rights court, even from the human rights court. Uh, the Turkey really uh, the one thing is uh, Turkey can really care about and it's economy because the economy in Turkey is really bad and it's going to be uh, worse I think and uh, if you want to uh, get some attention about it uh, I think uh, government can uh, warn uh, Turkey about human rights uh, government in Europe can care about really human rights because uh, they are uh, talking some uh, talking always something different. The Libya, Syria, refugees. Uh, the one very very the most important thing about the Europe government, I think, the refugee card in the hands of Erdogan, as you know. So yes, we get some support uh, from our uh, colleagues, uh, from the bar associations, from the organization, lawyers organization, but that's all. And uh, yes, uh, we appreciate this. this is really very valuable, really very important, but um, it's not enough to uh, change uh, something uh, about Turkey. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Do you feel that the support you have from colleagues and other NGOs and civil society is more useful uh, than having political support, especially given your position that uh, you, 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 yeah, some of the accusations are linked to terrorism and, and, and there are some political background to that, uh, to the accusation? 
would political support from states or international organizations like uh, the EU be uh, useful to you or would it put you in more danger? Actually, uh, there is one thing very, very important in Turkey about terrorism uh, cases and everything. Uh, Turkey defined terrorism very widely. To speak, to paint something, to comment, to everything can be terrorism. And this is uh, taken from anti-terror law. And if UA can uh, force Turkey to change it, it will help all of us, not only me, not only lawyers, the people are in prison for what they said, what they, uh, the comment, you know, the journalist, uh, the uh, HTP uh, minister, everyone is in prison because of the define, how Turkey defined the terrorism. And this political uh, change will really help. And from the refugee problem, UA was um, forcing Turkey about to change it, but now uh, it's very, very behind of uh, other uh, problems. Uh, so uh, the thing I mentioned, yes, we can be in dangerous. We are in dangerous, actually. Uh, the change, uh, something about the law, uh, to force Turkey changing something about the law. This is a political thing, but it is the really what we, uh, what um, it will help us. Thank you. Uh, I think Phil, you wanted to comment as well. well. Just very briefly in response to the question around um, around Europe, I think it's important to note that you know whilst we've much of this discussion has focused on. Um, highly authoritarian regimes in, for example, Turkey, Belarus, China, and, and, and elsewhere, um, that there are mounting problems in, in Europe. I mean, um, we, we see in Hungary the passage of legislation uh, which will significantly restrict the work of uh, lawyers and defenders working on uh, issues of LGBTI rights, uh, that already in a context um, where those uh, working to promote and protect the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, uh, where that work is 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 um, restricted and in some instances even criminalised. Um, I saw that just today the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, David Boyd, has issued a statement of concern around three pieces of legislation in the United Kingdom, uh, which he considers will fetter the work of environmental human rights defenders in particular. Uh, and of course, we heard at the outset reference to the the, the, the proposals in, in France to um, restrict filming of police, which would negatively impact on the work of lawyers working on issues of police accountability and systemic racism. Uh, so I think it's, it's very important to also be attentive to and, and vigilant about uh, the, the, the operating environment for human rights lawyers here in the EU. Uh, and I can, well, thank you very much for, for this insight. And uh, I can only share and echo what you said, because as you mentioned, Felix, at the outset of our discussion, even Switzerland is not immune to the discussion. As soon as you use the word terrorism, people are really scared. And uh, we've seen that in Switzerland that led to positive votes to accept uh, measures uh, entitling the police to take, to, to, to use in case of uh, terrorist suspicion, creating uh, notions such as potential terrorists. You're not even, they're not even uh, a case against you, but you could be a potentially terrorists. So uh, it shows that even in, in places like Switzerland, uh, which is at the heart of the EU, without being in the EU, you have that type of, of risk. Um, but uh, as Baroness Kennedy said, we're, we're not in a situation as serious as many of our colleagues here. Uh, but what we can all do, wherever we are, is to support uh, all those human rights defenders who are acting uh, and lawyers who are also upholding the rule of law. Um, so I think we've come to close now. Uh, we are at the end of our discussion, although we can, could continue uh, for the whole day, certainly. Um, I'd like uh, to thank, uh, uh, just I think Tatiana had uh, just uh, wanted to say something. So before we close, maybe I'll pass on the word to you. Uh, yes, I also wanted to add uh, uh, on your question regarding different kind of uh, like help and pressure. Yeah. Uh, do you do you hear me? We can hear you. 
Okay, great. Yeah, po politician uh, like uh, in politics and uh, from uh, human rights and bar associations. I think that all of them should be uh, should be used used and all of them uh, are useful because they have different uh, like tactic tactics. They have different goals and uh, different uh, maybe persons of group or groups that uh, they are aim to yes uh, this is like uh, some specific and different signals for uh, different persons uh, one of them uh, like uh, political uh, pressure yes it's uh, sanctions they are a signal to a government and to authorities and of course uh, help from and support from lawyers organization is a uh, uh, support and help also very really important help for human rights uh, defenders, activists, lawyers, because they should understand that they are not alone, they are supported, and that uh, international community, bar community, human rights community, constantly watching at them, uh, they are in the loop, they are supported. And um, I would, what, what I would like to say, uh, we, we also feel it in, uh, especially in Belarus, yes, uh, this kind of support, but as, as we say now, there, is, uh, there cannot be uh, much of help, so we need it constantly and more and more actually, because all this uh, happens uh, constantly, all such cases, uh, new arrests of human rights activists, uh, or media activists, also on uh, lawyers, and uh, more cases of disbarment happens all the time. So, and um, what I also wanted to say, uh, this uh, bar, um, bars and lawyers community also send a signal to uh, also authorities that uh, they are also uh, in the loop, uh, that uh, international community, community see what they do, what, how they violent, vi uh, violate the law, yes. And uh, mainly in Belarus now, um, we, uh, we understand, yes, and that the law doesn't work. And um, of course, uh, lawyers try to use all procedures, uh, as I said in the presentation, yes, they try to use all the procedures that exist um, in Belarus. Uh, but uh, now they're mainly focused on fixing all this uh, information on the monitoring so that it can be investigated in future. Yes, so that we can maybe in several years when the situation will change um, and the law will work, the law will start, start to work, we can get back to all these facts. This, uh, it will be tons of, tons of information because thousands of, of people suffered, but we will investigate it. Yes, and uh, um, in the end, the, the, the law will work and the people who are responsible for this violation uh, will be found, yes, and um, it will be uh, uh, announced also. I, I think these are very important words to, to end our discussion. It, it is important to doc document and, and get information on all those violations. It may be that uh, a trial cannot take place now, but eventually it will take place and the rule of law uh, will, uh, will prevail. Uh, and we'll all make sure that personally, but also our organization, that this will happen. So I would like to thank you all our panelists. So I. Um, I don't hear you. Okay. So uh, I don't know if you heard the round of applause online. No, okay. No. <laughs> I don't know if you had the conclusion, but it was just to thank you all, uh, panelists. Thank you very much for your participation, for your contribution, for your courage and your work. And uh, now I'll pass on the word to Felix to close our, our, um, our seminar. Thank you very much, Sandrine, and I'll be very short as we're over time already. But thank you all so much. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your powerful stories and for refusing to be silenced, actually. And also thank you for discussing the value of maintaining that political pressure that may be in shaming. And as we saw from studies from invaluable work of the International Service uh, for Human Rights or other NGOs, defending defenders, there is value of it, and we can, we can do something with it. I think there's also
also a value of holding those public events, keeping the discussion on, keeping the discussion going. Also like this uh, public event for the Human Rights Council, even if for the moment due to the pandemic and the continuing excuses of the pandemic for everyone, public events are not yet possible not even online. So there's no formal events, but those will come back, I'm sure. So I think it's very important to keep those discussions and I thank you all of you for um, well, for the support, for the participation online, and for those who came here to Villa Monnier to discuss with you. I would like to thank also in closing the Martin Ennels uh, Foundation, Ibari, and the Dash, the Geneva Bar Association, for your collaboration. I'm looking forward from the side of the Geneva um, Human Rights Platform also to continue that collaboration, to keep momentum, to keep speaking out, and to keep making public the cases that are going on. Finally, let me thank you, Sandri, for your excellent moderation and the team behind the screens, the tech team here at the Geneva Human Rights Platform for making that possible. Thank you all. I'm looking forward to staying engaged with you all. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye.